Bosner, the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. Uh, Mr. Bosner. First, I want to wish you all a happy and blessed Ramadan. At this time of self-reflection and renewal, I'm especially pleased to be invited here. I wanted to come to Afad Women's University today to speak to you, but also to listen and to engage with you in a dialogue. So I'm going to make some brief remarks and then I want to invite you to ask questions. I believe that Sudanese youth, and particularly Sudanese women, can and must play a leading role in building peace, stability, and broad-based economic growth in your country. I hope that some of you will do this within your government, but that all of you will do it as members of civil society. The United States government, and particularly my boss, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, have been emphasizing the importance of civil society in crafting strong constitutions, building stable societies, and developing sustainable democracies. In our country, and in a growing number of countries around the world, it is no longer unusual for young people to work in non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and then go into government. And after serving in government, many go back to become active in civil society. As you may know, Secretary Clinton began her career in an NGO. She was a lawyer for the Children's Defense Fund, and President Obama started his political career as a community organizer in my hometown of Chicago. In these roles, both of them represented vulnerable populations, and both urged the U.S. government to serve its citizens better. Now that's not to say that in a democracy, governments and NGOs always see eye to eye. They don't, and they shouldn't. But there is a common recognition that it takes the work of many different kinds of citizen groups to improve democracy and governance. They do it by informing governments about issues that may or may not have hit their radar, become known to busy officials. They do it by advocating for vulnerable people whose needs are not being met through existing government programs or policies. And they do it by pushing governments to do better and to work more efficiently, to spend time and resources on issues, issues that matter most to people. And they do it by holding those of us in government accountable for our actions. These functions are indispensable. I say this from a personal experience. I began my career, uh, as uh, Dr. Badri said, as a lawyer, and then did human rights work with an NGO for more than 30 years before joining government. Over those three decades, I've been able to see with my own eyes how the interplay between civil society and government has helped countries emerge from conflict and corruption and become stronger. Let me give you a couple of examples. When I first started working in Sub-Saharan Africa in the mid-1970s, there were working on, there were virtually no human rights NGOs in this region except for in South Africa and Zimbabwe, which was then called Rhodesia. Now there are civil society groups working on human rights and many other issues in every part of this continent. They are trying to turn weak democracies into truly representative and strong ones and make strong democracies grow more transparent and responsive. But unfortunately, in too many countries, there are still burdensome restrictions on civil society organizations. The new constitution that was adopted in Kenya last year was the result of de a decades-long struggle by civil society and government to create a constitution based on the rule of law and respect for human rights.
especially those linked with good governance and human rights. Uh, the last thing is the scope of the definition of uh, the civil society. Um, uh, I, I hope that it would include non-government, academia, and private sector, or what is the scope? Thank you. I mentioned that this will focus mainly on the youth in civil societies and uh, will help them gain internet freedom. So my question is, will this influence the technological sanctions that are placed on Sudan now, which are placing great restrictions on our internet freedom and our ability to communicate with civil societies, as Dr. Bilqi said, in other countries, and learning how to improve our civil societies? Thank you. The young people, if your dreams do, do not scare you, they're not big enough. Um, what I think, you know, we don't have expectations of you that are any different than what you should, your expectations should be or your family's expectations. Um, we know that young people here and everywhere want both economic opportunity and a job, and they want a share of their society to play a role in the political future of their society. They want to be treated with dignity. So I just urge you all to think about the contribution you can make to get involved, as I say, to get involved in civil society, to get involved in government, but to play a role in making this a better, stronger society. We all have to do that. I do it in my society. My hope and expectation is that people in this audience will do the same. The world is, uh, has opportunities today that it hasn't had in a long time. We're more connected. There's more ways to learn about what others are doing. But it's up to each of you in your own soul, your own heart, to decide uh, how much time and energy you're going to spend uh, to make this a stronger society. And that's my hope would be that you would do that. On the issue of how uh, the, the first three questions, uh, how much we can help with the Constitution, um, we're certainly looking at and, and watching closely what the process will be for the Constitution. I think yeah, our hope certainly is that it's inclusive and participatory, that it includes a Bill of Rights. Again, it's a Sudanese Constitution, as the Kenyan one is and ours is, but, but the process of deciding what it says is really critical. And that's part of the discussion we've had here with the government. Inclusive, participatory, democratic process. Um, second, in terms of learning about civil society in the US, we've just created a website. I hope it's not subject to some of those sanctions you described, but it's called humanrights.gov. And it's part of uh, our uh, State Department effort to give a broader sense of some of the things we're saying and doing, it's also a way for us to reflect on some of the things that are happening in our own society. Again, it's humanrights.gov. Um, and in terms of scope and definition, Secretary Clinton gave a speech in Washington, defines, I think, what we're talking about. Uh, among the elements she mentioned were a robust, open civil society, a free press, uh, rule of law, uh, independence of the judiciary, uh, transparency, accountability, uh, and, and free elections. All of those things, and, and free access to the internet, I'm coming back to that in a minute. Um, so I think for us, uh, again, trying to put those pieces together is really how we would define sustainable democracy with civil society being a central element of that. In terms of the uh, access to the internet, uh, we've also, Secretary's given two major speeches on internet freedom. Uh, we're doing a lot to support programs that both train activists on how to use the internet in a way that um, makes it more accessible. We've trained 5,000 activists in all parts of the world. Uh, the notion for us is not that we want to impose an American or a U.S. view of the world, but that there ought to be a neutral, open internet that's available to all. So if you're a medical student here in Sudan, 
you ought to have access to whatever materials you need uh, to complete your studies and to learn about what's being um, uh, studied and researched around the world. If you're, a, if you're a, a business person, you ought to have access to information that allows you to do your business. Uh, if you're a human rights activist, you ought to be able to find out what's going on. What are the comparative lessons of how countries have uh, drafted constitutions, or what are some of the challenges in war zones? So our notion is, and this is something we're trying to promote diplomatically, politically, as well as through uh, providing some grants and assistance for training and support and technology, is that the o internet ought to be an open platform. It crosses borders um, without restrictions on content. Obviously, there are areas like pornography for children or, you know, some uh, ir terrorism. There's some things that we would say no to, but there are, those are reasonable restrictions. We think the internet ought to be an open platform that allows people to communicate across the globe. And that's one of the opportunities, again, of, of living in the 21st century. It really has opened the window for lots of ideas to cross borders. Please, you've been waiting a long time to here. Thank you all. Some great questions, and I really enjoyed it.